About 20 years ago, Prince of Peace helped to found a school in the Dominican Republic called the Dulos Discovery School. Back in February, I joined nine great guys from Prince of Peace for a mission trip to serve at the school. Now, this was my sixth trip to the Dominican Republic, and it is now a place that is near and dear to my heart. While we were there, some of us got to talking about the country, and the question came up, what's the biggest export from the Dominican Republic? Well, some of us thought that it might be coffee. Others thought it might be tobacco. One guy said he thought it was baseball players. But what we discovered when we looked it up surprised us all. It's gold. Gold. The Dominicans export millions and millions of dollars of gold every year. And in fact, the fifth largest gold mine in the world is in a town called Pueblo Viejo in the Dominican Republic. Now, despite the fact that this gold mine is only 60 miles from the school where we serve, and it employs thousands of people, I'd never heard of it. And when I asked our missions director, Eric Elton, about it, he'd never heard of it. When I asked the director of the school about it, he'd never heard of it. So now I was curious. When I got back home to the States, I did some digging. And I discovered that the gold mine is a political hot potato in the Dominican Republic. It generates significant income for a nation that's struggling economically. But the environmental impact of the mine is catastrophic. Gold mining uses cyanide to leach the ore out of the earth. And that cyanide is poisoning the water supply, killing livestock, and making children and adults very sick. Here's why I'm telling you this story. If I had never been to the Dominican Republic and had read about this gold mine and its environmental impact on the surrounding area in the newspaper, I'd have thought to myself, ah, what a shame. And I would have kept right on reading to the next story without much thought. But because a part of my heart lives in the Dominican Republic, because there are people there whose names and faces and stories I know, I can't just move on. I feel called to action. Love compels me. And I tell you that not as a point of pride, but honestly as a point of shame. How is it possible that I call myself a follower of Jesus and yet I read stories like this one all the time and simply move on? Part of what we've sought to do in the first two weeks of this Sacred Earth series is to reframe the world's perspective. That if it doesn't impact me, I don't have to care about it. And to call us to embrace a kingdom perspective that says that we are all connected in this human family. And part of what connects us is our mutual dependence upon the land, water, and air with which God has gifted us. Let me say that another way. We don't just care for creation because the earth is the Lord's or because it's simply the right thing to do. We care for creation because brothers and sisters around the world whose names we may never know and whose faces we may never see are being negatively impacted by our lack of care for creation. And that, my friends, violates the prime directive of our Christian faith the call to love our neighbor. Now that reframing from me to me and my neighbor is the point of one of Jesus' best known stories that comes from Luke chapter 10. Let's listen together. Just then, a religious scholar stood up with a question to test Jesus. Teacher, what do I need to do to get eternal life? He answered, what's written in God's law? How do you interpret it? And he said that you love the Lord your God with all your passion and prayer and muscle and intelligence, and that you love your neighbor as well as you do yourself. Good answer, said Jesus. Do it, and you will live. Looking for a loophole, he asked, and just how would you define neighbor? 
Jesus answered by telling a story. There was once a man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. On the way, he was attacked by robbers. They took his clothes, beat him, and went off leaving him half dead. Luckily, a priest was on his way down the same road, but when he saw him, he angled across to the other side. And then a Levite religious man showed up. He also avoided the injured man. A Samaritan traveling the road came on him, and when he saw the man's condition, his heart went out to him. He gave him first aid, disinfecting and bandaging his wounds. And then he lifted him onto his donkey, led him to an inn, and made him comfortable. In the morning, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take good care of him. If it costs any more, put it on my bill. I'll pay you on my way back. But what do you think? Which of the three became a neighbor to the man attacked by robbers? Well, the one who treated him kindly, the religious scholar responded. Jesus said, go and do the same. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So, what is this story have to do with our calling to steward the earth? Well, I would suggest several things. First, according to Jesus, the neighbor we are called to love is anyone in need. And when we fail to do what we can to care for the planet, we are failing to care for our neighbor. Maria is a farmer who lives in the Amazon rainforest region of Brazil. She's been farming for over 20 years, but in recent years, she's noticed changes in the weather patterns that have affected her crops. The rainy season has become shorter, and the dry season has become longer, making it difficult for her to grow crops. Maria also suffers from respiratory problems due to the air pollution caused by deforestation and wildfires. Ahmed is a fisherman who lives on the coast of Egypt. Now, he used to catch fish easily, but now he has to go farther out to sea because overfishing and pollution have depleted fish stocks near the shore. Ahmed also worries about rising sea levels, which could flood his home and destroy his fishing boats. Sarah is a student who lives in Sydney, Australia. She loves spending time outdoors, but lately she's had to stay indoors because of poor air quality caused by brush fires and industrial pollution. Sarah also worries about the future of her country as climate change leads to more frequent heat waves and droughts. Friends, these are just three of the neighbors whom we'll probably never meet, but whose lives are impacted by whether we each care for or fail to care for creation. Second, caring for our neighbor is costly. <laughs> caring for the man beaten and left at the side of the road, that costs the Samaritan both time and money. And quite frankly, many of the things that we're called to do to care for the earth will also cost us something. I mean, it takes more time and energy to walk or ride your bike to the store than it does to drive your car. It costs our privacy and our time to coordinate a carpool to work or to other events rather than simply driving alone. It may cost more to buy food or clothing that is produced sustainably and, and doesn't use sweatshops or slave labor to produce. And it'll take time and effort to research what products are safely and sustainably made. <laughs> Ignorance is easy. Responsibility can be challenging and time consuming. Friends, it takes time and effort to advocate for sustainable practices that take a long view rather than the short view of financial gain or convenience. And then finally, caring for our neighbor takes commitment. 
You know, the priest and the Levite in the story, they both saw the opportunity to care for the man on the side of the road, but they wouldn't commit to doing anything about it. They turned a blind eye. They just walked away. And every time I fail to do what I know to be right to care for creation, I'm the priest and the Levite, turning a blind eye and walking away from my neighbor in need. Instead, I, I want to be a Samaritan. I want to respond to Jesus' call to love my neighbor by committing to caring for this earth we and future generations are dependent upon. Now, that can seem overwhelming. Where do we even begin? How can we have an impact? Well, here's some good news. Every commitment, every step in the right direction makes a difference. Want to see what that commitment can look like and be inspired? Watch this. You know, I wish I would have been here in the 40s to see all these really beautiful forest and wooded areas. Imagine going out there and getting lost with your friends. All of that, all of that was here. And then they took it out. They're really green. It's rich. But it's just green, green. Taking all that carbon dioxide, giving us all that oxygen. Man. It's sad. Sad. But the good thing is that now we're here and now we're planning, giving back, starting a new generation, and we're going to make it happen again. The enthusiasm is always there, yeah. and that's yeah, for me personally, that's pretty meaningful. Um, it's meaningful for me because I get to work a alongside people like yourselves who are very passionate and want to make a difference in the community. This is a part of the process of greening the East End. It's turning it into a green belt. It's returning back to our history. This area was known in the past as an area that had pecan orchards and orange tree orchards, and, and we lost that over the years, but now we're bringing it back. And I'm just extraordinarily proud of all of the leadership, from the parents to the students to the teachers to the principals who are committed to this program to make sure that we have a beautiful green place for our children. We want people to be able to come from all over Houston to see what we have here in the East End and enjoy it as well. But most importantly, let's focus on the health, well-being, and the greening of our area. And I just can't wait to see these trees continue to grow. And when you give to others, there's something that money can't, you can't put a price on that. The power of giving is, is um, something that it's, it's nice for us to teach our kids. How cool is that? I mean, stories like that inspire me to respond to Jesus' call to love my neighbor by caring for creation. So rather than hearing stories about the Pueblo de Ejo mine in the Dominican Republic, shrugging my shoulders and thinking, well, that doesn't impact me. Instead, I'm exploring how I can support organizations like the, the Magis Americas which are supporting local communities that are negatively impacted by that very mine and advocating for safer mining practices. Friends, if you're hearing Jesus calling you today and asking who will be a neighbor to those who are suffering from the degradation of this sacred earth and you want to respond, you want to respond saying, here I am, send me, that I would encourage you to download a copy of the 10 simple things you can do to better care for the earth and your neighbor that you'll find on our website at the address on your screen. The time to commit, rather than turning a blind eye, 
and walking away, that time is at hand. At the heart of it, caring for creation isn't about politics or economics or the science behind climate change, as important as those things are. For a follower of of Jesus, the, the heart of caring for creation is caring for our neighbor. So that when Jesus asks the question, what do you think? Which one of these is a neighbor to the person in need? We can confidently answer, I am. Let's pray. Lord, this world you've made is achingly beautiful and intricately designed, not just to sustain life, but to to delight our senses. Make us mindful of the impact of our decisions on our neighbors around the corner and around the world. Make us good stewards of your creation, guided and empowered by your Holy Spirit. May love for you and for our neighbor be the power that motivates us and moves us to action. This we pray in the strong name of Christ and together all God's people said, Amen.